Welcome everyone. We're just uh, waiting for more people to join and we'll get started. Okay, hey, while we're waiting for more people to join us, please enjoy some of the photos we have as we have our rolling slideshow go for a little bit. I love some of these old photos. Allow a few more minutes for more people to enter. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. I think I have a newspaper article somewhere in my parents' stuff. My dad was in, I think it was taken by the bulletin staff. And it's when they were exiting the yard one day, and I don't remember what year. It could have been 41, but it was before 42, because he was drafted in 42. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. Wait about one more minute to let more people join and then we'll start our program. All right. Okay. I think we can start. Um, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for our program, Sun Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company, yard, shipyard number four. I'm Lori Grant, Executive Director of Delaware County Historical Society, and I am here with uh, Delaware County Historical Society board member, uh, Chester City Council member, and prolific blogger, Stefan Roots, and my colleagues behind the scene, uh, Erica Berman, who is our marketing manager, and Paul Hughes, who is our outreach associate. Before we introduce our guest speakers tonight, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask all of you who are attending tonight's program to please consider donating to Delaware County Historical Society. 
Our budget is completely funded by fundraising, and we count on the generosity of people like you, of our residents, to uh, be able to present programs like tonight's program. So please consider donating to Delaware County Historical Society. Just a little uh, bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the program. So please keep your questions until the end. And Erica will be collecting them off the chat room. So you can just type them up and we'll, we'll, we'll present them. Um, so here we go. And I hope you enjoy the program, Stefan. Thanks a lot, Lori. Hi, everybody. I am so honored to present our featured guest speakers tonight. We have Mr. Dave Cavanaugh, president of Sun Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company Historical Society, and Dr. John McLaurin, recognized author and professor of history. In addition, we'll hear from a couple locals, Mr. Reginald Thompson and Mr. Len Laurie, both from Chester, both Chester High graduates, hooray. And uh, both of them were very generous to share their family and personal stories about life at Sun Shipbuilding with us. So where, where do we want to start? We're going to start with Mr. Dave Cavanaugh. He was raised and schooled in Chester upon graduating in 1964 from that rival across town, St. James. He was immediately hired right after high school at Sun Ship. He started as electrician's helper. He worked in the ship's engine room. He went on to join the four-year electrical apprenticeship program. He became a first-class electrician. Throughout his 18 years at Sunship, Dave earned, or he served in numerous departments from crane repair to third and second shift leader, to plant maintenance and ended his career at what was then named Penship as a plant supervisor in 1982. After Penship, Dave went on to the Mechanical Electrical Division at Philadelphia Suburban Water Company, now known as Aqua, PA. And in 1986, he became the General Manager of Communication and Installations. And from 1986 until his retirement in 2010, Dave served as President, Control, Design, and Manufacturing. And then finally, but certainly lastly, Dave Cavanaugh started the Sunship website you guys got your pens ready? I want you to write this one down. This is, this is good. www.sunship.org. He started this back in 2001. And he started the Sunship Historical Society in 2004. So without further ado, you guys are in for a treat. I uh, have had the, the pleasure of, of meeting Dave, although it was a long time ago at a Martin Luther King presentation at the Salvation Army here in Chester, where he had the full display in the background. He had a few of the guys that worked at Sunship with him. And I tell you, it was really fascinating to sit and talk to those guys who put in the work. So let's hear it from Dave, straight from his mouth. Let's find out what it was like down there at the shipyard. And for those of you who don't know where the shipyard is in Chester, if you've ever gone down 291 and see a place that's called Harris, Philadelphia, formerly Harris, Chester, that is formerly the shipyard space. So take it away, Dave. Stefan, thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to thank Lori Grant, Paul Hughes, and uh, Erica. Um, gee, here we go. There's my memory. Berman. Sorry about that, Erica especially Marge Johnson though, because she assisted us through the years in developing the history of Sunship. Now, moving on. Uh, first place we're gonna go is setting the stage. And we put this together because it was interesting to find out the things that caused Sunship to happen. Um, so we start out here by talking about pre-World War I, and that U.S. shipbuilding was not competitive with shipbuilding in Great Britain and Europe. And when you look at that number of 91%, it'll probably get your attention because that's the amount that 
our shipping goods that went to Europe and Britain were on foreign flag ships. So it takes us down into that nine, nine percentile area. Um, in an effort to build up shipbuilding, the uh, United States passed a law that would prohibit registering of foreign built ships in the US. So that was supposed to move more shipbuilding to us. And on the average, we were 40% higher in cost of building ships. So now next slide, Paul, please. This is just to give you an order of magnitude of ship shipping tonnage available during before the First World War. And, and these are drawn to scale, uh, roughly 20 million tons for Great Britain, British Empire, 5 million tons for Germany, Norway was down at 1.9 million, and France was 1.9, and then we get to us at 1.8. So um, we, we were down pretty low on the, and counted heavily on foreign ships, which now we're not there. Go ahead, Paul, please. So Sun Company, they had bought a few ships to get themselves um, being able to ship their oil, but these were all converted ships to handle barrels, 55, I think they were actually 50 gallons at the time, but barrels, not tanks to fill. And um, so they decided to put the refinery in Marcus Hook because deep water channel with the Delaware River, close to rail, and also had the possibility of pipelines in the future as that was starting to happen. Well, so now here comes the impact of World War I. Starting World War in 1914, all that shipping that you saw all went back to their home ports. And here we sat with nothing. So Sun Oil lost its transport, transport capability and domestic and foreign shipyards all of a sudden were booked out three to four years. So the rule of thumb became, you gotta build a yard because you can't wait three to four years. So uh, railroads were operating at a maximum capacity and pipelines were not economically viable and early, early stages of development. So th they were in trouble at this point. Paul, please. So the pews came along and I put them left to right at the bottom. There's the family tree. And uh, Jay Howard um, was uh, president of the yard from 1916 to 1917. And he was also simultaneously president of Sun Oil. It was called Sun Company, but it's always been Sun Oil to me. And so his brother, Joseph N., came in to take over and he took over from 18 to 19. Then they brought a, a cousin in, John G. Pugh Sr., who became the father and godfather of the people working at Sunship. He never met him, but when you read stuff about him, the guy was tremendous. And his son, John G. Pugh Jr., started in 1932, I believe, and he passed away in 64. So the logic about this slide is the pews were actively involved in Sunship from 1916 to 1964. And I think that comes out to 48 years. So all of you would. And what we're looking at now, and I'm gonna grab the mouse here and hope that I can move. Oops, let me see if I can find it here, folks. Okay, I don't know whether you can see that. I hope you can. But this is the very first shipyard. This is the 1916 version. And what we have over here where I'm, I'm scrolling the mouse is five elevated shipways. So ships would be launched on an elevation. And above it was the steel shops. Steel would come in, go through, come out to this area and then be picked up by the respective cranes. So the river frontage of Sun Ship was 1,750 feet, started at 50 acres, and in the early 20s, 2021, would grow to 80 acres. They have one significant crane, which is this yellow dot here on the map, and that was a 120-ton hammerhead crane. As you can see on our thing, Sanborn map, courtesy of VCHS. Thank you. Um, 
Sun Chief Incorporated in May of 16. And as an example, Scott Paper, who was our downriver neighbor in 1903, had a river frontage of 384 feet. Sunship started with 780 and 50 acres. And in World War II, we had 2.5 miles of shipbuilding. Next, please. And I got infatuated with Rachel. I'm calling her Rachel like I know her, but I feel like I do. And Rachel, let me get on here for a second. I do need my cheat sheets. I apologize for that. Uh, this is a photo, my first photo that I could find of Rachel from 1941 Our Yard magazine. She was born in Salem, New Jersey in 1982. And she started at the yard in 1920 at 38 years old. And she was um, an office matron for John G. Pugh Sr. So she, she, she was right at the top. And I would have loved to have done an oral history. But anyway, that wasn't to be. In 1943, early, she transferred to the cafeteria staff. And then she got a call in 43 from John G. Sr. asking her if she would be willing to christen the first ship launched in number four yard. So she first said, no, it's too much, I'm shaking. And so finally, John G. Pugh Jr. got a hold of, of Rachel and asked her again, and he said, you really should do this, and she did. So she became the first black lady to christen an ocean-going vessel. And that's quite significant. And it was also the first vessel that was launched out of our number four yard. Next week, Paul. And here's a picture that we got from the Temple Archives. She's posing for the christening photo shot. That's John G. to her right, and well, her left, my right. But anyway, and it's just prior to her breaking the champagne bottle on this little piece of steel that you see here. It's added on to make this break faster and cleaner for them. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I'm gonna go through some more of her history real quick. Um, so in, she received her 35 year pin from John G. Pugh Jr. who was vice president at the time. And she retires from the shipyard in April of 57. She had a big 100th birthday celebration in Chester at St. Daniel's Church. And um, she passed away in July, at July 12, 1985, at 103 years old. So, uh, one more, please. So, Rachel was a significant, to gain 35 years tells you dedication. You know, so I'm, oh my. Anyway. So now where we're gonna go is we're gonna to go to some technology because it was important technology. Sunship came out with the first all welded ocean going vessel and it was called the White Flash. And what was happening with this was it's a coastal, so it's much smaller, but Atlantic Refining said, okay, we'll test it. You build it, we'll take it, see how it works. It worked very well and we built three full-size tankers from them. And some of the interesting facts are typical full-size tanker, 1,300,000 rivets. I can't comprehend that. I was able to find one rivet and I have that. Uh, the use of welding required less labor and reduced the weight of the ship by 13%. In just over a decade, almost all ships would now be welded and welding would have a dramatic impact on the construction and productivity in the Second World War. Paul, please. I don't wanna to get too far ahead of my notes here. What we're looking at, of course, is it, it's an aerial view. I don't need to explain that. And it's of the central yard of Sunship. And what we see here, this is the Ridley Creek that borders Eddystone, I'll stop shaking here. Uh, borders Eddystone Stone and the city of Chester. And we started out with five shipways. 
and they're going to be this was the original number one um this is their number one shipway right here and then it went two three four and five and then they decided in the early 20s that we needed longer shipways and more so number one and two if you kind of notice the crane travel beams go out further on the first second and eighth and that was a big deal back then for them to do that this early in the game and right here is that 120 ton hammerhead crane that we talked about and it had all the main lifting capacities for example on pier three there's no cranes they haven't got there yet there's one crane on pier two but later there'll be two cranes on each pier and lifting capacity won't be a big deal for us over here on the far right, there's two 10,000 ton floating dry docks. These are things that made Sunship so important to, to shipping industry and the Delaware Valley. We were the only shipyard on the Delaware River that had floating dry docks. And we can move, please. And now we get to fast forward in, into the mid or 43, middle of the war. And over here on the left, I'm going to be reading some of this here. Sunship workforce grew from 3,000 employees in 38 to 35,633 in 1943. And things that happened on the sidelines that you don't think about, transportation of bringing people into the job site. That was an unbelievable thing that happened from Philadelphia, from Wilmington, from out towards Harrisburg, all coming in to work. And this was happening everywhere, not just at Sunship, obviously. Of this number, the 35-6, 2,800 were women and 12,000 were black. An interesting fact for me was when I read the payroll department required 1,300 employees to handle a cash payroll of $2 million a week. Sun changed the checks in mid-42 because the federal government Maritime Commission decided they should. During that time, Sunship employees bought 35,000, oh, oops, sorry, 35 million, I'm reading that wrong, 335,000 in war bonds, 241,000 round figures uh, to Chester Community Fund, and 192,000 to the Red Cross. And finally, Sunship purchased $364 million worth of materials. Order of magnitude is just astonishing. Please, next. One thing Sun was really known for was its tankers. Uh, from the very beginning, we, we were a tanker yard. And this first one, this, these are, this is a T2. It has a single screw and it does about 14, or propeller, 14.5 knots. And it was the first T2 tanker maritime commission that we built. And um, Sun would build 198 of the 500 T2 tankers built in all the shipyards. What was interesting was Sun Ship shared, shared this technology with a lot of shipyards. And I happened to have a blueprint from a T2 tanker with the Sun Ship logos on it. And it's from Alabama Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. So even their prints didn't change. It, it went with them. So then something else occurred. We could not keep up with the Navy fleet in this, are in this arena. And so we had to build a T3, two propellers, 19 knots. That could keep up with it. Next, please. And now we have Sunship and women in the workplace. And uh, World War II marked the entrance of women into all the different industries. They worked in ours and they came out and they welded. They found out taking advantage of physical attributes. They had smaller hands. They could get into tighter places in building assemblies. And so things worked out. And this is Jeanette Schiff, Swift. This is our first lady to go out and work in the shipyard. So she worked here as a welder from 42 to 45. Next, please. And now we're at uh, Sunship's number four yard. And real quick, I'll be, shortly I'll be turning it over to John. Um, contract was signed with Maritime Commission to build number four yard, which took us in, into 
the fourth yard. It's on ship, henceforth four yard. And you'll, you'll notice Dr. Emmett Scott's involved in this. Uh, launching of the first ship, the Marine Eagle was the first ocean going vessel to be built by, an, and this is the text from the time. So an all African American crew and peak employment in the North Yard would be nine. So I'm going to move this along now to uh, to John, if we're okay on time. Did I run over a minute? No, you're you're you can keep going, or we'll have stuff. Well, on. I'll go. I, I have been trying to speed up here. Okay, but Yard Four built the following: one tank carrier, six troop ships, and they were converted to hospital ships that hung around into the late '60s eight troop ships, five freighters, and 35 railroad car barges. Is there one more? <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, so that's the end of my portion of it, and I look forward to hearing John's. Should I take over? Good um, evening, everybody. Well, hold on, John. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> let, let, this well, man let is stomping at the bit. Violence. I thought I was supposed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just want to. Uh, that that was a great presentation. I it, it's it's interesting just to see it from an aerial view, looking down at an area that's no longer there. One question I have though, he said it took. How long does it take to build a yard? Because you said you had like a a two or three year period where there were no ships around so Hughes decided to build a yard how long does that take yeah the, the, I don't know whether it was the time or the fuse or a combination of the both but things did happen with them and this started building and I'm not going to get it to the month but um they started building in early 1916 and they launched their first ship in early 1917 see that's amazing in today's oh, world Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it would have been four years of engineering, five years of permits, six years of government intervention. There's no way you could have done that today. So I don't I believe so. Them. Thank you. Uh, where do we go from here? Laurie, do you have any comments, questions? I uh, actually, if you actually, if you could introduce, give uh, uh, Dr. McLaurinen his introduction, that would be great, Stefan. All right, so here we go, Dr. John M. McLaurin. He's a native of Delaware County. He attended both elementary and secondary school in the county, he graduated from high school in 1967 and served in the U.S. Army from 1968 to 1970. Subsequently, he worked in various trades before matriculating at Millersville University in 1988. Dr. McLaurin earned his BA degree in history and philosophy at Millersville and then went on to get his MA and PhD degrees at the University of Delaware, finishing his formal education in 1998. In 1999, he joined the faculty at the Millersville History Department, where he taught courses in 20th century American, Latin American, and Pennsylvania history and published articles on political, civil rights, and women's history in Philadelphia and Delaware counties. Now, I think many of the people, and I've seen some of the, some of the blocks with names in them, we refer to one of his writings as almost the Bible. It's called Ruling Suburbia, John McClure and the Republican Machine in Delaware County. Nod your head if, I can't see you guys, but <laughs> nod your head if you've read that piece. That, that's if you haven't read it, we're going to make sure you, you get access to it. It is a great history of, the Ch of, of Chester, Pennsylvania. Uh, he served five years as department chair, four years as chapter president of the faculty union at Millersville and retired in June of 2021. We also have with us uh, Mr. Reginald Thompson. He grew up in Chester. He lives in Lansdowne now. He has a strong interest in Black history and in the history of Chester, former, former employee. So we're happy to have somebody who actually worked there. And then uh, Mr. Len Laurie, uh, I have to admit, definitely a friend of mine. We go back quite a ways. Yeah. Uh, he was born and raised in Chester, now resides outside of Chester. And I, I'm, I, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to, to fathom that you actually worked 
at Sunship because we're just so close in age. But it's just like when we were kids, that's where our dads worked and our uncles and our big brothers and our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to have you on to bring us up to like that that period right before the shipyard, you know, turned hands and, and right before it closed is going to be really interesting to hear from you. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. John. Can I call you Dr. John? I think that's a fun way of. of sure. Why not? You. Although I can't play the piano. You can't play the piano? No. Uh, I read your piece. It's called Pie in the Sky versus Meat and Potatoes. And let me tell you, uh, the title threw me. I'd never heard that that term before, but it didn't take long to read through your piece to, to understand what it meant. And it's a term that I'm really looking forward to hearing you kind of flesh out for us. You know, we're in Black History Month right now. It's the month of February. And a big part of the story that we want to share tonight uh, about Sunship Building is that you heard it a little bit, uh, yard four, yard four. So I'm, I'm not going to share it. I'm going to let Dr. John, share it. So the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you very much. Um, as far as the title goes, I got it from a professor of mine who teaches uh, in the African-American Studies Department at Delaware. He suggested it. I had never heard the term either. Uh, nonetheless, to jump right into the story, um, when the, the announcement was made in the press that Sunship plan to open uh, a yard staff by 9,000 black workers. Uh, it set off a firestorm of debate in the black community locally and nationally. The Pittsburgh Courier reported that an industrial utopia was um, rising along the banks of the Delaware River. The Philadelphia Record called it a sensational piece of good news and Chester NAACP President Herman Laws said that it was the first step towards total desegregation. On the other side, the Philadelphia Tribune characterized it as unnecessary, undemocratic, and not helpful to either America or colored people. The Chicago Defender opposed the plan saying that when the Negro asks for democracy, he means equal treatment not special treatment at the expense of his white brother. The national office of the NAACP wrote to John G. Pugh advising that racial segregation of workers leads inevitably to misunderstanding and antagonism. It charged the plan was a violation of FDR's executive order 8802, which forbid discrimination in, in, in defense related industries. And it also ordered Chester Local to retract its statement, which Herman Laws did uh, rather grudgingly. But at the same time, the NAACP spread the word throughout the country that skilled jobs were available for Blacks at the Sun Yard in Chester. The overriding question um, for me and for people at the time was, why an all-Black yard? The pews offered no explanation and consistently refused to be baited into defense of the plan. Emmett Scott released a few prepared statements, but these offered little substantive explanation. The pew, pew's purpose clearly was not to perpetuate segregation per se. For nearly 100 years of family history argued against that. The pews had been solid champions of black equality. But there were several other possibilities for the creation of this yard. Uh, the Pew's PR priority obviously was not to segregate their workforce, but to emphasize the training of black men in a manner modeled on Booker T. Washington's gospel of work and money. Learn a trade or a skill, establish yourself as a competent, honest, reliable tradesman, and you will earn respect and eventually equality. Joe Pugh's choice of Scott as personnel director indicated that he believed in the efficacy of Washington's approach. Perhaps it was simple pragmatism. The Pews had always employed blacks, but only in low paying, unskilled jobs. The war had increased the country's need for ocean going transports while robbing the labor pool of a substantial percentage of its workers. Pugh knew that blacks would have had to be trained in skilled trades 
but the introduction of blacks into all white workplaces risked race-based labor trouble. Whites had staged a hate strike at the Chrysler Corporation, the Alabama Dry Docks Company that, that Dave just mentioned about and elsewhere. When the Philadelphia Transportation Company announced the hiring of eight black motormen, 6,000 white employees staged a wildcat strike that paralyzed the entire city until federal troops were sent in. A similar shutdown at Sun could not be tolerated and a segregated yard would minimize that possibility. Hence the decision to open a black yard may have been a concession to the realities of race relations in 1942. Organized labor had a different read on Pew's notice. CIO leaders saw the all black yard as a thinly veiled attempt to undermine their efforts to organize sun workers, a bitterly fought campaign that had begun in 1936 when the CIA, or CIO rather staged a walkout. Consequently, a competing union, the Sun Ship Employees Association won certification. The CIO continued its efforts claiming the Employees Association was an illegal company union which used cheating and intimidation to quash CIO activities. The Third Circuit Court of Appeals eventually threw out the results of that decision and ordered a new certifying election for the summer of 43. It was in the final stages of this dispute that yard number four opened. The CIO claimed that the Pews had wanted to isolate their black workers from CIO activists while pressuring, pressuring them to join the Employees Association. Mounting tension between the two factions finally erupted in violence in June of 1943 when company guards fired into a crowd of pro CIO employees. One died, four were wounded, three of the wounded were later tried and convicted of inciting a riot. The guards were not disciplined. The CIO nevertheless won a slim 50.9% majority and the Pews eventually agreed to terms with the CIO. If the purpose of the, ward, the, the yard was, was to defeat the CIO, the plan failed. Payroll considerations may also have been behind the yard. Executive Order 8802 called for equal pay for equal work in war-related industries. The pews complied with the letter, but not the spirit of the order. Salaries were equal throughout the shipyard, but the pews were under no obligation to equalize bonus plans. Bonuses were not salary, but rather discretionary benefits and were limited to the white yards where bonus checks were as high as $1,200, while black incentive checks were far lower, as low as $1. At the end of the war, a majority of yard number four workers wished to be transferred to one of the other three facilities where they would be given the opportunity to share in the bonuses. Other observers believed the project would to be politically motivated. Joe Pugh had become a dedicated foe of the New Deal after FDR indicated his intention to impose price controls in the oil industry. By 1940, Pugh and his siblings had contributed over $2 million to the Republican Party. His money earned him the title of boss of the state GOP. It also earned him the condemnation of those who believed him to be a reactionary billionaire attempting to buy the government he wanted. One congressman included the pews on his list of outstanding American fascists. Joe scoffed at such charges saying, you can't get votes simply by advertising for them. The black vote was especially important to Pew. In 1936, tens of thousands of black, black voters had voted Democratic for the first time. Chester's black population remained Republican, but traditional GOP strongholds were suddenly a shrinking minority. The black yard critics charged was Pew's response to this challenge. It was a purely political stunt, so said the Chicago Defender, intended to retrieve the Republican party from the oblivion into which it had fallen. Political pundits closer to Chester saw a local angle to the project. 
Joe Pugh was locked in a struggle with John McClure, ex-state senator and longtime Republican boss for control of Delaware County, home to both Sunship and Sun Oil. McClure had an unsavory past. In 1933, he had been convicted of bootlegging and extortion. Eight years later, he had narrowly avoided another conviction, this time for swindling the city of Chester out of a quarter million dollars. Testimony in McClure's bootlegging trial had revealed that he had used Sun Oil tankers to import port liquor into Chester. To make matters worse, McClure was a close friend of Aggie Campbell, ex-prize fighter, ex-state trooper, um, on and off again boilermaker and general troublemaker at the shipyard. Few suspected McClure had been behind much of the labor trouble fomented by Campbell. Consequently, Pew was bent on McClure's political destruction, a goal that could be achieved by co-opting Chester's Black community, buying that vote by creating thousands of jobs for Blacks was, according to some, Pew's weapon to win the all-out fight to break the McClure political death grip on the county. Ultimately, Pew was no match for McClure as a politician and that his effort in that regard failed. Throughout the summer of 42, construction on the facility and recruitment of black workers proceeded apace. By the end of the year, nearly 6,000 blacks had been added to Sunship's employee roster. The keel for the first ship was laid in December 42, and the following May, the SS Marine Eagle was christened. That's the, the ship that Dave was speaking about. In May 1945, Yard Number no. 4 launched its 20th and final ship, the SS Marine Runner. Scott's personal office was closed in July, and Sun began the process of redistributing Yard Number no. 4 workers to its other three facilities. During the next 16 months, Sun made continuous cutbacks in its labor force. By January 1947, the shipyard was back to 1939 levels of about 2,000 employees. Of that number, about 525 were black. Bread Holland, Jerome Bread Holland, Scott's assistant at the yard, made an in depth study of blacks who worked at Sunship during the war. This became his doctor of dissertation, by the way. He found that the Pew's decision to train blacks in previously white only trades had proven to be beneficial for all involved. In the final analysis, he judged the yard a success. Just as Scott had predicted, it validated Booker Washington's approach to race relations. Curious, curiously, however, he never mentioned the existence of yard number four. Several factors suggest that in nearly every respect, yard number four was not a success. It was closer to a failure. Contrary to the boast of an all black operation, blacks made up 100% of the workforce, but 0% of the management. And the Maritime Commission, Maritime Commission claimed racial tension continued to be a serious concern throughout the life of the yard. The union dispute exacerbated, exacerbated this tension. Even after the CIO won certification, the majority of Blacks refused to sign on. This may have been due to the historic mistrust of the union movement or to the state, excuse me, the state of loyalty to Pews and to Emma Scott. But at the same time, it may have stemmed from prevailing racial prejudice in Chester and Delaware County. Whatever the reasons, Blacks refused to join, <coughs> rejoin the union and this exacerbated racial animosity that persisted throughout the yard's existence. Productivity was an equally serious problem. Between December 42 and September 45, yard number four with eight of Sun's 28 ways produced 20 ships, average build time 13 months, average tonnage 11,385 tons. During that same period, the North Central and South Yards produced 132 ocean going tankers, average build time four months, average tonnage 10,233 tons. Yard four took approximately four times as long to build a ship as did the other three yards. 
Now, there were several factors that contributed to this difference in productivity. Yard number four built C4s, which by design took longer to complete. The other yards produced tankers, ships with which sun workers were intimately familiar. Moreover, the C4 program was plagued with delays due to design changes. First tank transports, then troop carriers, then hosp hosp hospital ships, and finally back to tank carriers. And finally, num yard number four was staffed with newly trained black tradesmen who could not compare in experience, speed, or efficiency with the workers in the other yards. All of these issues seriously hampered the yard's success. In fact, the only true success of yard number four was the socioeconomic benefit to the blacks who worked there. The economic part of that success was for the most part transitory as thousands were laid off after the war. The non-economic benefits were more permanent. The experience of the yard confirmed what black organizations have been arguing for years, that the time for full social, political and economic equality had arrived. Working in the yard bred a new maturity and a new sense of purpose. It became the incubator for a new cadre of black civil rights activists in Chester. One yard worker, George Raymond, would assume the presidency of the Chester NAACP and lead a successful post-war assault on discrimination in employment, housing, and public education in Chester. Whether or not that was part of Joe Pugh's plan, nobody knows, he never said. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. And the story to me is <laughs> it, it ebbs and flows. It goes up and down. There's good and bad. There's questions. It's like getting back to the title, pie in the sky uh, versus meat and potatoes. That's really, a, a, I guess, a statement on the pews taking a gamble on the value of segregation versus integration. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, they really had a choice to make. Do they have a yard of just black people in a time when segregation was thought of by a, a lot of people, not the thing to do. We want to integrate, it's time to integrate. The pews figured, no, not in my yard. We know the problems that happen when we integrate, especially skilled positions, especially positions that pay well. They saw it in other yards, the type of fights that occurred and the type of uh, work stoppages and strikes. So they made the bold move to give us uh, yard number four and it paid well and people got skills. So that was the meat and potatoes part. And those who supported the meat and potatoes part of that gamble, uh, those that opposed were the pie in the sky uh, crew who said, no, integration is the way to go. Is, is that sort of the yes, dichotomy exactly between those two it. terms? That's exactly it. That's why the, the national NAACP ordered Herman Laws to retract his his approval of yard number four because the NAACP had always, their position had always been integration, non-discrimination. And they would, to they would tolerate no plan, uh, no situation that hinted of segregation or discrimination. And then there's the, the story of the, the union. That seemed very intriguing how well, you, you explained to me, just, just let's center on the union battle there where Pew was accused of using the blacks to get the union that he favored and have the blacks vote for them. But, but what happened as a result of that gamble? Well, the, the, the Pews obviously were opposed to any unionization of the art. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't remember who it was who, who came up with the idea of the Sunship Employees Association, but it was, I'm assuming it was Joe Pugh because he was the political Pugh. 
that was his answer to, to demands for a union, a, a union that would be created by Sunship and controlled by Sunship. At the same time, the CIO was organizing shipyards up and down the East Coast. And Sunship was one of the last to be organized and they wanted in. So th the battle centered on, uh, on Sunship and more specifically on yard number four, because black workers in, in the 1940s and 1950s and before really had a, a, a major distrust of the union movement in any, in any shape or form. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, so they were kind of forced into a situation where they would have to vote. In fact, the day of the certifying election, the final certifying election, more than half the black workers in the yards did not show up for work. They wanted no parts of it. But it ultimately, um, Joe Pugh and his plan failed. The CIO won by the thinnest of margins. And with the N NLRB breathing down their necks, uh, the Pews were forced to recognize the legitimacy of the election and, and deal with the CIO. Uh, but it was a nasty fight. It was a fight. There was more than one riot, uh, not necessarily race riots, but more union riots in, at, at the shipyards during the course of that fight, which lasted from 1936 until 1943. And of course, the one that I just mentioned, that, uh, that resulted in a couple armed guards shooting some CIO organizers and killing one and putting a couple in the hospital for which they were never punished. At least I couldn't find any indications they were ever punished. But it was, you know, it was part of the larger union uh, picture in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, because it was, it was these kinds of, of struggles, very violent, deadly struggles throughout the industrialized United States, as unions fought for, to get a toehold in various industries. The pews were just absolute, in that regard, the pews were incredibly conservative. Um, they had their good points, but pro-union was not one of them. Hmm. So the other thing that fascinates me about this story is that when I begin to hear it, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for a good story. You know, maybe a, a story that's been hidden and not heard from the fact that we had a black yard, a yard with, with all these employees putting ships out this one statement is that uh, it was the first ocean going vessel in the long history of American shipbuilding to be all Negro constructed. So in short, in the short term, we brought in novices, people who never touched a screwdriver maybe, put them together, trained them, got them to build ships. But then later on in the story, we learned that their productivity wasn't even close to, if you will, the white yards. In, no, it wasn't. And, you know, I'm sitting here struggling to, 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 to ask myself, because this was only a four-year run here at yard number four, if I'm, if, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, was it a victory or was it a failure or did they just get that one win and the game's over? H how do you view this? I suspect that it had the yard remained in existence, and had the plans not been constantly changed by the Maritime Commission, I mean, they, they, they had to, to change over from tank, tankered ships to hospital ships, to troop carriers, to whatever. Uh, and that combined with the fact that these guys were all relatively new. They had just been trained and, you know, set to, to do these jobs that they had very little experience with. I think if the if the yard had stayed in existence for six or seven or eight years, and if the the plan had been to make a specific kind of ocean going vessel, that their productivity would have rivaled their productivity in the other yards. Still, in all, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I think that the biggest uh, story of this whole thing was the group of people. Now, Herman Laws 
he got into trouble with 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 Pew, and he was president of the NAACP when he worked in New York. But I don't remember exactly what he did, but he offended the Pews in some way. And next thing you know, he was drafted. And, you know, back then, the, the draft boards were locally, locally uh, controlled. So they just got rid of him by sending him off to the army. And they thought they had a, a kind of pliable guy in George Raymond. Raymond ended, you know, he stayed at the yard um, throughout the war and he didn't get in the kind of trouble that Herman Laws did. But George Raymond wound up uh, president of the NAACP for nearly 25 years, I think. And he's the guy, contrary to what other people have written about Stanley Branch and others in Chester, it's George Raymond uh, who really was the, the uh, motive force behind the civil rights movement in Chester. And I don't know, perhaps because of his personality, he would have, but I don't know that without the experience of working in the yard, of getting the, the responsibility of, of having to do things, having to supervise other people, that he would have been as effective as a, uh, as a leader in the, in the NAACP. Uh, if you want a real story, and I promised Lori that I'll do it, but I have <sighs> three tapes of my interviews with George Raymond. Oh, boy. That's a story. I know the Raymond papers are also at Widener in their archives. So uh, yeah, it, that's a good segue. One, one, uh, we, we, we want to bring, we want to bring, uh, what do we want to do? We want to bring Dave back. Reggie. Reggie. <laughs> so, okay, let's bring Reggie and Lynn in. Uh, these guys worked at the yard and let's hear their experience. So let's see, we'll go with Reggie first. Hi Reggie, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Reggie Thompson. Actually, I worked at the yard from 1975 to 77, but really I'm here to talk about my mother's experience in the yard. My mother's name is Florence Thompson, She's now 96 years old, wow. and, she, and she worked in shipyard number four. She was hired, she was, when she was hired, she was, she was 19, she was 18 years old. And as you see, this is, okay, what you're looking at is a copy of her, it's her, it's Sonship's, her resignation acceptance letter. It's dated April 11th. 1945. So I think she was hired in 43. She still has this letter <laughs> and she still has it because it's signed by Emmett Scott. She really didn't know who Emmett Scott came from, where he where he went, but it was important to her because she, Emmett Scott worked, he was a special assistant and secretary to Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee. And back then, Chester was, was segregated, and there was, and she went to a school named after Booker T. Washington. So it was her link to history. Mm -hmm. So, so mom was hired. There was a school in, in, in Chester called Sleepers College. Sleepers College was actually a secretary, a, a secretarial school. So she graduated from Sleepers, and someone told her. They were hiring at the shipyard. So she worked directly for Emmett Scott and, and Jerome Holland. And she was, she told me that there was a ship that was, that she had a chance to tour a troop ship and it was christened by Ruth L. Bennett, a prominent Chester oh, yeah. worker. Yeah. And let's see. And she also said that there was there was a housing shortage in Chester. And so that they housed shipyard number four employees in train cars in a railroad yard at 
Lamokin Street. Hmm. So is that her nickname, Rosie the Riveter? No. Oh, okay. Rosie the Rosie the Riveter is a name for all the women who worked in the war industry. So lately, there's been an effort. There's been a, a there's been an effort to honor Rosies, hmm. and also, and like most things, black folks have always left out of history. So now there's an effort to honor black Rosies. So she has been to several Rosie the Riveter celebrations. And this is this is a picture of her at the Liberty Bell on Labor Day. And the picture of her holding the Lincoln head was she was honored at, at the Union League several years ago. Gotcha. Yeah. And I know Twyla Simpkins has done uh, some work on the Rosies. So. Right. That's really Hey, Len, you, you out there? Len Laurie? Yes, I'm here. Hey, let's let's hear your story. Okay, <laughs> that's me right there. <laughs> <I'm> for him. <laughs> yeah, so my story is uh, pretty brief. Um, I started working at the shipyard when I graduated from high, Chester High School in 1976. Uh, this was my first job out of high school. And um, I, well, let me, let me go back a little bit further. I, I grew up in the foster home system. So when you turn 18, you, you, you age out of the system, so you're, you're no longer a ward of the state. So my mom says, okay, so what are you going to do now? I said, I don't know. But she said, you're going to the military, you're going to college? I said, I don't know. And then my dad knew someone who worked in the office at Sunship where they had an apprentice program for uh, burners. Um, we're the ones with the torch that cut the steel. And so I, I enrolled in that program and started working there. Um, and then when I was, I was making good money, I brought my first car, you know, was able to buy nice clothes and everything. I was like the man in Chester. That yes, I had you were. <laughs> I, I will attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> I had money. So I said, wow, I was, uh, I think I was making like over 200 and some dollars a week. And that was good back then because right. my, my, my mother only charged me like $25 a week in rent. So I had a lot of money. And, um, but uh, as time went on, I was there for three years, like I said, but as time went on, a lot of the older uh, workers, they suggested that I don't get caught up down there. They didn't, they thought I was too, I don't know, I, I guess they thought I was too clean cut, that, 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 that the shipyard wasn't for me. And uh, so I, I, I tried to brush it off. And then as time went on, you know, each, every time they would put me with someone else, they, everyone said the same thing. And so my father always tell me the truth always sounds the same. So I, I kept hearing it and hearing it. So I said, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna get out of here. Cause I started seeing also the guys that have been there for like 20, 30 years, what the effect that the yard had on their body, which just wasn't, wasn't that good for me. So I said, I don't wanna wind up like these guys down here. So um, I wind up uh, going to college. I left there in 79 and, um, and I went to college and um, that's it. But I, I grew up there. That was a very turning point for me uh, because I became a man working there because I, I didn't know anything about life and everything. But just sitting talking with those guys was, was great. By me being a burner, what I did, what they did, they they parred you every morning. They paired you with a ship fitter and a tack welder. So it was three of us. So they would send us different parts of the boat. And that's where we stayed all day long to do whatever we was doing. Ship fitter had the blueprints, did what he had to do. I, I cut out the steel, what he needed. And um, the tack welder tacked it up and we was done. So I had a lot of time to sit down and just talk with a lot of the, uh, the older guys that were there. And they, um, they all said the same thing, man, you don't get caught up here. We, we got families, we got kids, we got mortgages. I said, don't, don't get, if you get caught up in here, it's hard to get out. So uh, that was my experience uh, working at the shipyard. Well, mm -hmm. you, uh, you got out right before things closed down anyway. So I did, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So all those all those warnings those guys were giving you, I'm sure they had to maybe eat their words because they were all out of work real soon. And I knew a lot of those guys. Many of them were welders. Mm -hmm. And like you said, many of them were uh they aged well before exactly. their 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 years. Exactly. You know, inhaling, especially the welders, inhaling all that smoke. Um, it just wasn't good for the for the lungs and everything. It just just wasn't good. So I, I got out of there. Then it was, the, 
And then it was dangerous, you know, because you know they had their own ambulance uh, right on the right on the right on the ground. So you know people were getting hurt left and right. Mm -hmm. So you never knew when you went to work, you never know if you want to come home. So it was, yeah. it was very dangerous. And the other thing that we have to recognize is that there were an ancillary businesses in Chester that supported Sunship. So I, I just think of Bolton Anchor yeah, right. as, as one of the ones that guys would go in there. And literally, that's what they did. They made bolts yep. and they made anchors. They made <laughs> chains. It was a, sort of a metal forging place where you'd walk by and you can just feel when the oven opened. It would just almost mm -hmm. singe your eyebrows off. <laughs> exactly. But Atlantic guys were... Atlantic mm -hmm. Steel, remember that Atlantic Steel, yeah. on Sixth Street. Yeah, so it was a lot of, a lot of, it was a, lot of it, was, it was a good time back then. Um, they, like I say, they they were hiring right off the street. Well, my father, I think the most interesting story my father ever told me, and he came through in the '40s, was that if you had a strong back, you could work anywhere up and down the river. So if it didn't work out, it's Scott Paper. You could go to the shipyard. If it wasn't the shipyard, it was Allied Chemical. If it wasn't there, it was Sinclair. If it wasn't there, right. it was Sunoco. Those guys, uh, there was plenty of work, you know, right. back in the 40s and 50s. So I, I imagine a lot of the guys who were no longer at the shipyard during their heyday, you know, got picked up in, in mm -hmm. any of those industries up and down the riverfront. Exactly. exactly. I want to I want to ask uh, Dave a question. Uh, Dave, you still out there? Right here. Hey, Dave, you know, you mentioned all those employees during the heyday. You said close to 35,000 employees. I just want to put that in, in terms of where we are today. Our city doesn't even have 35,000 35, <laughs> residents. Yeah, I mean, no there were just as many people working at Sunship as there are living in the city of Chester right now. That's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. Did we have back in the 60s, were we in the 60,000 range in Chester? I would say 60,000 and falling fast. Yeah, but it was 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's dropped dramatically. And the businesses have gone. Yes. You know, I don't know what, what it is to hold people here. I mean, there's still enough jobs, I understand that. But not as many to pick from, I think. Is that true? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm just fascinated at the, the image of 35,000 people coming to work every day through the streets of Chester. It's, it, it's, it's, it boggles the mind. I know the city probably is, we, you know, we have an infrastructure that could probably support 70,000 people. We're sitting on 30,000, 35,000 right now. So we still have a lot of room to grow. Sunship was obviously our, our, biggest, our biggest employer ever, and it will never be duplicated in a single industry. And we have never found a way to replace it. But it, it, you know, I just kind of <laughs> imagine when I hear my parents talk who, you know, came through the 40s and 50s and how great it was to, and, and looking at the photos and the presentation also of how they were dressed at the parties and, you know, with dignity, suits and ties and hats. And, you know, my father, mother would, would say that if you walk down Third Street, you better be dressed up. <laughs> and I can just only imagine it was all these, these families that hey, worked hey, in Steph, these great hey, jobs. Stefan, when they, they also dressed when they went to work, they had showers and everything in there. So they put on the work clothes to, to go to work. Mm -hmm. But after they got off, they, they got dressed and went home. You would thought they was working at an office or something because they got clean when they, when they left out of there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about one of my experiences, if I may, mm -hmm. and that I was partially raised in Sun Village. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the morning when I'm, and now I'm in my teens, so I'm working at Sun Ship. So you come out of the house and you get on the sidewalk and you start walking towards Sun Ship. A couple of houses down, somebody gets out, gets alongside you walking down. And by the time you cross over the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. there must be 60 people, 70 people. I don't know. Pick a number, mm -hmm. but a crowd. But it was so interesting to watch that crowd grow coming out of the houses. You know, when you get down 8th and Elsinore and all, all those places, the people were just all going towards Sunship. And you made somebody made a statement, I don't remember who, that it didn't matter. Anybody you talk to knew somebody that worked at Sunship, be it a friend, a relative, it doesn't matter. But it was, it was a tremendous, and it was also a social gathering place. 
-hmm. people would would go down to the ball field on H Street. If you remember the ball field on 8th. How old do you think I am? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm putting you up in my category here. I apologize for that. Not intentional. But um, it, it was great, you know, and I, I have all good memories, very few bad ones, you know, but uh, the crowd, the people, when, when at the end of your shift on day shift, even with, say, 4,000 people there, it was a mob scene coming out of it. <laughs> you know, and the parking lots, the streets got all backed up because people couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was in more ways than one, a very interesting place to work. Wow. Hey, John, I got one question for you, and it has to do with the pews and that name Sun. You know, they had Sun Refinery, they did the Sun Ship Building, and it, it, it was you, uh, Dave, who kind of sparked, uh, you said you grew up in Sun Village. And then we have Sun Hill, and then there was the Sun Center. Was all that part of the pews? Yes. Yep. Sun Sun Ship got money from the government, but they managed it to build Sun Village and Sun Hill. Okay. And that was so. That was First World War. I'm, I'm now I'm picking a date because I don't have it up here in my head. I'm saying 18, 19, 19, 19, 19 you know. Mm -hmm. In the 18s and 19s is when that was built. So they were building it for their employees because there wasn't enough yes, house? exactly. Because mm -hmm. there was like a round figures again. I, I hate to quote figures. 10 to 11,000 people working there in the First World War. Mm -hmm. So that was a significant number. And I don't know if you remember the apartment houses. Do you ever see the apartment houses on Morton Avenue? Yeah. Right near some village? There was a, yeah. a block. Because they built houses for small families, they built houses for large families, and they had apartments for people that weren't, that were single. So it was an interesting concept to build all that, and it, was, it wasn't the only place, of course, it was done. Visco Village is the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, so this was company housing? Yes, and you had to work at Sunship to get right. into the house. Hmm. Wow. Your wheels are spinning, John. I can see it. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just thinking of what, I, what I've read about company housing in different industries where it wasn't so pleasant, like up in the coal fields in Schuylkill County. Um, that was missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the, it, it, the it sun, would have been different. Yeah. The pews were, I think, at, at their roots, they, they had integrity. They certainly were interested in making money and they knew how to do it. But, um, and they were clever about it too. When they first decided to build ships, it was because um, John Rockefeller was in the process of gobbling up all the oil um, refining capacity in the country and gobbling up these, these, these little companies right and left. And the only way that the pews, I guess it was old man pews, thought he could avoid um, becoming a victim of Standard Oil was to market his products overseas. And of course, he needed ships to do that. So he, got the, he brought the oil up from Spindletop, Texas, and which, by the way, was not really... Uh, Spindle, the Texans did not want to see John Rockefeller in Texas. But nonetheless, the Pews brought the oil up from, from Texas to the refinery in, in Marcus Hook and then shipped it out overseas so that he would not be a threat to the Rockefeller uh, trust. But I didn't know that... that I, I've read a little bit about the pews. I, I didn't realize that they actually had company housing. It shouldn't surprise me, um, but I wasn't aware of that. So we know out on Concord Road, there was Sun Center, and I guess that was their big playground. Is that right? Right. They, okay. And also, I've got my, uh, back to number four shipyard. My uncle, now I think he worked the number four yard because 
he was a first class ship fitter at Sun Ship. And this is during World War II. And he went, he applied for a job at Philadelphia Naval Yard. And he was, they only offered him a job as a third class ship fitter. And he said, no, I worked at Sun, I'm a first class ship fitter. So after he complained, they said, all right, well, we'll make you a second class ship fitter, but don't tell anybody. So then he said, I'm a first class ship fitter. Why can't I be a, a first class ship fitter here? He said, well, here's the story. First class ship fitters supervise a group of men. And because you're colored, white people won't work for you. So we can't make you a first class ship fitter. Hmm. But did he complain? And somebody in management recognized his talent. So what they did was they made him a ship fitter's inspector with the same pay as a first class ship fitter. And he worked by himself inspecting and he reported to the person in charge of, of the yard. So I assume, you know, for him, being in, in the number four yard was opportunity that he wouldn't have had anywhere else. So listen, um, we're, we're, no one's, we could probably talk till 12 midnight <laughs> if anybody wants to hang in there, but we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. We do want to entertain a few questions. Erica Berman's out there. She's scouring the chat room. Um, I just ask that let's, let's try to answer as many as we can. So whoever does answer these questions of the four of you, just, just give a sentence or two so we can blast through a few of these. All right. Okay, so um, I will say we only have a few uh, questions that were actually submitted in the chat, but um, we like to leave the opportunity for people to take themselves off mute. Um, so if you would like to ask your question or you wanted to share your own personal story, um, just raise your hand and then we can call on you. Um, one of the questions that we got was, um, did those industrial jobs move down south or offshore? And I guess this was referring back to um, when you were talking about the Sunship closing and some of the other industries. If, if, if I may comment on that, the, a lot of the jobs did go offshore in shipbuilding and it made it tough. And they were operating at a cost around, and I, I always have to be very vague about the percentages, but about 50 to 60% of what we could build them for. So the marketplace moved overseas. We even had Sun Oil have ships built offshore while we were still working as Sun Ship. So we were experienced with that, we knew. So that helps. Thank you. Um, this was back at six, 57, um, tell us more about the Chester Community Fund. What was the money used for? Uh oh, that's going out of my area of expertise. I was just very pleased to read that the workers donated to them. I don't know if Stefan or somebody else there might know the Chester, but I do not. So I can't, I, I can't talk to them. I can't help you on that one either. No worries. Um, another question was, uh, were the other yards integrated were any of the other yards integrated they had black workers but they weren't working in skilled jobs yeah every one of the yards had black workers but they were the unskilled the laborers the people at the bottom of the uh the workforce ladder the yard number four was unique in that number one, it was an all black yard or allegedly an all black yard. But number two, that blacks were trained in all the skills uh, needed to build a ship. Well, I know from my personal experience, John, being an apprentice, you moved around to the different parts of the ship that were supported by different gangs. There was an engine room gang, it was a deck gang, a wheelhouse gang, a house gang, you name it. and in all the ones that I went through, and this is a tough statement to me, the gangs made four or five men, and there was usually at least one black in each of the gangs. And they were first class electricians because I was put with them to learn the trade. Right. So I did see them, not in big numbers, 
you know, but they were there. Well, as I said, when they returned to pre-war levels of the 2000 employees at Sunship, about 500 were black and they were, they were spread out all over the place. Yes, exactly. Thank now, you. whether including one black uh, worker with a, a gang of four or five was, was a purposeful decision that was made, I don't know whether they were trying to avoid uh, troubles or that's just the way it worked out. I don't know. Well, I don't think he was, a, he would have been in my case anyway, a space filler because they put me with him to learn the trade. Right. And that should, should mean something. Yeah. Unless they didn't care about me. I didn't know that. Well, I'm not saying it would have been That's a space humor, filler, but what I'm wow, saying please. was, um, I don't know whether they would have wanted to see a gang with four of the five members black. Don't know. But, you know, this is the 1950s and 60s and you know, race relations were in total flux then. Um, and on top of that, the pews were just very strange people. Okay. You know, it was said that, that, that they could, the, the two or three guys that ran the Sun Empire could sit down in a room down on South Broad Street and make decisions that another corporation would take months to make because it was company owned and they had their own way of doing things and they thought they saw the world in a certain way and they saw their place in the world a certain way. And that was very unusual, very unusual. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have Zuline Mayfield has her hand raised. Hi, good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for such a um, a rich uh, uh, narrative of, once again, our Chester community. Um, it, it's amazing to me um, the amount of history that comes out of our little city of Chester. And I will hope that at some point, um, so the future generations can visually see um, the historical value that Chester has had on a lot of communities and worldwide, um, some sort of memorial or some sort of an acknowledgement of, of the contributions to Sunship in the shipbuilding field. And also um, as to the um, contributions uh, from the people that worked in uh, shipyard number four and also the women because at one time my sister worked at Sunship. Uh, my, I had a brother and a sister who worked there. Um, and this was probably the, on the latter days of Sunship, but my sister worked there. And I was always fascinated when she would put her gear on and go to work. And I'm like, my God, where do you work at? I, you know, I was much younger and I was like, I thought she was going to war every day. So, but I, I thank all of you all for, for the keepers of the memories. But I think that um, for my generation, I think that uh, Sonship should be memorialized in some way. Um, it's a shame that people don't even realize that that was in Chester. Um, so, I, I think that that should be a project um, somewhere uh, so that we can visually see and show our children. Okay. Thank I you. Agree. That's all I want all to say. Right. I do, I do um, offer you to look at the sunship.org website. Dave Kavanaugh, who is the founder and president of the Sunship Historical Society, has done incredible work in collecting and maintaining and going through years and years of documents and artifacts and just has a wealth of knowledge and has preserved um, a, a large chunk of sonship history um, and has done an amazing job in doing so. So I do, I do um, welcome you to, to visit his site. It's pretty amazing. And if, I'm, if I may, Lori, um, we, ju we just posted the entire Our Yard magazine segments from October, yeah, September of 1941 
through December of 46. So that would be a very interesting view of the shipyard during the number four yard and the war years and women in the workplace. Oh, so. can you put the link in the chat? Cause I can't seem to pull up the right one so people can access it. Um, we have M Meg Egan. Oh, there. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, it's sunship.org looking for me. Um, Meg Egan um, has her hand raised or their hand raised. I'm gonna unmute. Okay, just unmuted myself. When the layoffs began post-war, were the men working in yard four the first to be laid off or how did, how did the layoffs sort of play out? Well, like, like most union environments, you know, it's typically last in, first out in seniority. And I don't know personally if that's how it happened, but I would assume that was. That was pretty much the way it worked for yard number four. Okay. Um, they and a, a, a number of the yard number four workers were assigned to different yards, but they were for the most part relatively new hires. And so you're you're right, last in, first out. Particularly in a union shop. Any other questions out there? We're getting to our closing time here. I have a question. I've got it. Okay. Go <laughs> My question had to do with the type of ships that were built at the yard. We, we focused on yard number four, but uh, there were some warships built there. And did they go into battle? The, the only warships, and I, I qualify all the time, the only warships I'm aware of were three mine sweepers that were wooden ships that were built in the First World War. I'm not aware of any other military ships that were warships. We had military, uh, we did repair work on a multitude of ships, be they military, military fighting, military cargo, but not building from scratch. I got a, something to say. I uh, I was doing some research, and I was curious who was Jerome Holland and Emmett Scott. And what I found out about well, Emmett Scott was a uh, got his bachelor's and a master's from Cornell. He was Cornell's first black football player, and then he taught at Lincoln University. He came from Lincoln University to the shipyard. Later, he got his PhD and he, and he worked for the Pew Foundation and he became the president of- Hampton Delaware. Institute. Well, first of all, he was president of Delaware State. Oh, that's right, yeah. And then, and then uh, Morgan State and then Hampton. And eventually appointed ambassador to Sweden. Right, right. Was he, he was ambassador to Sweden. Yeah. He was also the first black appointed to the New York Stock Exchange. And, and I think he was he was on the board for the for the for the Red Cross. Well, he had a fabulously, fabulously successful career. Right. Unfortunately, and, his son has run into some problems in New York City uh, with his business activities. But but Jerome Holland, his, his resume is just incredible. It is. I was surprised. And, and also, I, I think, and this is just a suspicion, I, I think he was very close to the pews, particularly Joe Pew, and his failure to mention yard number four in his dissertation was kind of uh, uh, something that he did for the pews, because by the time he was writing his dissertation, perhaps an all black yard would not have been something the pews would have been terribly proud of. Maybe so. And also found out that Emmett Scott, you know, everybody, you know, he, he left Tuskegee and Emmett Scott became the special assistant for Negro Affairs to the War Department in World War I. Well, that's and, the Booker T. Washington influence. Yes. 
And I, and I, I just finished, he wrote a book that's called Scott's Official History of the Negro, of the American Negro in, in the World War. And it's a very, it's a very detailed account of the black soldiers in World War I. And he also mentions a, a paragraph about black shipyard workers and how in at Hog Island in Philly and Sparrows Point in Maryland, he said the black the black workers were very efficient, but there weren't any opportunities for higher employment. So things hadn't changed. No, yeah. Interesting. Twyla, I, I see your hand raised again. Uh, would you like to, to say something? Twyla? Sorry, I'm not trying to move Um, Hello. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Um, just wanted to ask within the archives uh, of, of the Historical Society, is there a specific Black archive or is there a specific archive on Yard 4? Uh, my particular interest is in, in Black history with, uh, about within Chester and about Blacks. Um, so just, just curious that I can go right, right to it. Well, we have 125 linear feet of archives, and I guess I'm arbitrarily 10% through. So it's, it's, it's very difficult, but I do have some stuff, um, documents that were acquired uh, by John Costello. And um, I'd, be happy if, I'd be happy to uh, scan them for you and give you the digital copies. Okay, okay. I would I would appreciate that. I, I'll I'll be in touch. Yeah, you can get me through the website if you wish. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and I I'd like to thank you and and Reggie. Um, I I thank you for for participating in this. You're um, welcome. And and I, and I will be in touch. All right. <laughs> okay. If you're studying uh, Black history in Chester, um, I would suggest, and I'm not that you look at the, not, not what I've written as far as blacks in Chester, but the, the citations from what I, they, the, the mass, when you do a dissertation, you wind up with a whole lot of footnotes. I had about 2,300 and they're equally distributed among the ch seven chapters of the book. Yeah, but if you, Mr. if you send me, excuse me? Is this you speaking? I'm I'm sorry. Yes. I'm, I'm actually driving. Okay. Yes. Oh yes. I I um I have marked marked my book of yours up. <laughs> well, Quite substantially. Well, so yes. <laughs> look at the footnotes that there. Uh, there's a whole lot that that I looked at uh, that were in the footnotes that I didn't include in the book. Um, and that's when I start researching something. I, I might find a document, a book, an article or something, and I go immediately to the footnotes because that's where you'll find that it'll just, everything will unfold eventually. Well, well thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just returning to the city from um, the Smithsonian Black, um, the African American oh. Museum. So right. I'm, not, I'm not even home. So that's how I'm catching this. But when I heard Ruth Bennett and some of the things that I'm, I'm studying and finding, um, so I'm just keenly interested in, in knowing more about her christening the ship and just, again, all of the things that she did, which would add to the arc that uh, is evolving around her from my organization, the Yes Center. So I just appreciate knowing these things and uh, sometimes taking a shortcut, if I can, to get to the information. But knowing sometimes you just got to dig in and do what you have to do. So I thank um, all presenters and, and this, this was great information shared. And if I may, again, take a look at the website in the Our Yard magazines. There's always a page or two devoted to Four Yard. So all right. There's going to be a lot of chronological information in there. Thank you. You. Okay. And thank you, Twyla. I think that's a good point. And, you know, we learned this last year when we're putting together the event on civil rights and school segregation. And I just put the link in the chat to that. 
um, page where, you know, we want to make these as we're doing research and we're covering this history and trying to, to make our archive uh, comprehensive to everyone's history um, and making this available and online. So, um, you know, we've learned and gathered so much different materials, even putting together this event and Dave has such a great collection too. So I'm um, hoping to, to every time we do something like this, making it available after uh, digital. Great. All right, I think we are out of time here. Um, although as, as um, Stefan said, we could probably talk on this topic for hours and hours and still uncover new, new facts. Um, I think what tonight's program really demonstrated was that in exploring the history of industries, we're really exploring the history of society as well and society's norms. You can see them reflected in the history of of, of corporations or, or industries. Um, it, they really reflect what was going on in society at that time as well. And that is one of our goals here at Delaware County Historical Society is to bring to light some of the topics that are sometimes uncomfortable to talk about or difficult to discuss. Uh, we think that, that bringing things to light and having open and honest conversations about them is part of, of sharing history um, and understanding that, that many of us have a shared history, especially here in, in Delaware County. So I wanna thank our guest speakers, Dave and Reggie and John and Len, and of course, Stefan, our moderator and our board member, thank you. I thank Erica and Paul who have been working behind the scenes to make all of this work. And I thank all of you who, who um, came to our, our virtual program, who attended our virtual program. And please note that we are funded 100% by fundraising by um, our, our listeners and our, our researchers, our attendees. And um, so we hope you will support us. We, have a very full schedule for this calendar year, and we will be uh, exploring topics that we think many of you will find interesting. So thank you very much for attending and thank you to our guest speakers. You're welcome. Paul, can you take the slide down? So and anybody wants to take their camera off or you know, just wave. I like to do that at the end of the meeting <laughs> so you get to see faces. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for inviting you. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Have a nice evening. Take care. Good night.